So explicit memories, including semantic and episodic information, are things that we can declare and they're stored in the hippocampus, which is that horseshoe, like a double horseshoe shaped part of the brain. And it really seems that the hippocampus is the part of the brain that is like the temporary holding space for information and memory before it gets moved to other parts of the brain for long-term storage. So we need the hippocampus for forming new memories, particularly new explicit information, things we can tell people about. This is the idea of context-dependent retrieval. I really like this idea because it suggests, for example, that it would be unfair of me to ask you to take your test for this class in another room, especially a room that didn't look or feel much like this one. Because as you learn the material for this class, the items that you learned with your effortful processing, the items you tried to learn, got attached to all kinds of other things in your web of association. Like what kinds of things might get attached to the items you're trying to learn besides other information? The people you sit around. Exactly, the people you sit around, maybe how they smell, right? If Harley's shampoo has a special smell, right? That's gonna get attached to the information you're trying to learn. The way it sounds in here, the way it feels. So that why people would sit in the same shoes every time? I don't know why people do that. I think that has to do with territory and sociology. Yeah, I think it has to do with claiming their territory. But, because um, we're so territorial, we don't realize it, but we really are. But, um, if, for example, I used to, I adjuncted for Randolph College for a while, and their students have an honor code, so during finals week, I would print up the finals, and, um, they could come check them out at their convenience and take them wherever they wanted to. So, but the, the best place, according to this idea of context-dependent retrieval, <coughs> the best place for them to take their final would be where? In the, same room. In the classroom where we had our class. So for web students, it might be wherever they study. They should study in the same place and even at the same time of day and when their body feels the same way before or after eating because all of those things are then going to get attached to the information they're trying to learn. So here we're talking about context dependent retrieval which says that retrieval is specific to encoding and in particular remembering is best when your context or your environment at retrieval matches your environment at encoding. So Divers who learned a list of words on land or in the water did better when they were tested in the same place. So if they learned them in the water, they did better if they were tested in the water. If they learned them on land, they did better if they were tested on land. That's context-dependent retrieval with state-dependent retrieval or state-dependent mem memory, your emotional or physical state is another factor in your web of association. So we know, for example, that Dalton can't stand me, right? He hates me. He probably talks about that after class with you all, right? <laughs> can't stand me. And so he's got this seething feeling of hatred every day while he's sitting in class. Now we know on that April 11th test, someone else is going to proctor, so he won't have me to be angry at. What should he do? that day to make sure he gives himself the best chance to do well on the test. You should have a picture of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a picture of me to make him angry or find something else to be really angry about because that emotional state gets attached to the information you're trying to learn and then is part of the web of association and serves as a cue for it. Similarly, we know that Dakota drinks, what, 8, 10, 12 cups of coffee every morning before coming to my class, right? Plus a couple Red Bulls, is that right? Sure. Yeah. He should do that same thing on the day of the test because that physiological state of having all that caffeine and energy drink in his body gets attached to the information he's trying to learn 
and serves as a cue for it. And mood dependent retrieval means that you're going to do best if your mood when you learn something matches your mood when you retrieve it, but there's also the mood congruence effect. And this suggests that you, if you're in a good mood, you're going to notice and remember things that are congruent or consistent with your good mood, right? So you're picking a lovely lady up for a date and you show up on time and bring flowers and you have reservations and concert tickets ready to go. She's in a good mood. She's going to notice and remember the good things about you. You show up late with no plan and a car with no gas in it, right? And oh, by the way, I brought my ex-girlfriend <laughs> and my little brother. So now she's mad and she's just going to notice and remember bad things. When you're in a bad mood, you notice and remember bad things. That's the mood congruence effect, which is different from mood dependent retrieval. Mood dependent retrieval would say if you're in a bad mood when you learn it, you're going to be more likely to remember it when you're in a bad mood again. Okay, so um, Connor, you had a question. With the serial position effect, we know the items at the beginning of the list are subject to the primacy effect, which is part of the serial position curve. Items at the beginning are first or primary, and you remember them best because there's nothing to interfere with them. And you always remember them best, whether it's right after you hear the list or three weeks later. Whereas the recency effect, which refers to items at the end of the list, only applies to immediate recall, right? If I wait an hour and then ask you what you remember, the recency effect no longer applies because it's not recent. <laughs> so items at the beginning and end of the list are remembered better right after you hear it, but if we wait an hour, then only items at the beginning are remembered best. So, okay, so we learned our French first from 10 to 12. We learn our Spanish later from three to five, and now you have a French test. We know that the Spanish that you learned later is gonna go back and interfere with the French you learned first, that's what? Retro. Retroactive. But what instead if you have a Spanish test? But the French you learned first is coming forward and interfering with the Spanish that you learned later. What is that? Proactive. Proactive. Okay, so that storage of our memory is that when you form a memory, there's actually a physical or physiological change in the connection between neurons where that memory is stored. I think this is really interesting because we like to think of the brain and body as separate and as psychological things as happening sort of <laughs> separate from the physical body. But here we see when you have a psychological event and you form a memory, there's actually a physiological change in the very place where that memory is stored so that the connections between neurons where that memory is stored become strengthened. And another word for strengthened is potentiated. Um, to potentiate something is to increase its strength. So over time, the synapses where familiar memories are stored are physically stronger in their connections to one another because of this long-term potentiation or strengthening over time. So then it's more easy to access memories that are familiar. And so in your book, they have a couple of experiments about messing with long-term potentiation. Chemicals and shocks that prevent long-term potentiation can actually prevent learning and erase recent learning. If we give you the right kind of drug or if we uh, give you um, and there are LTP blocking drugs, long-term potentiation blocking drugs like propanolol, um, it inter which is a type of beta blocker, but it interferes with your long-term potentiation. So 
in um, in experiments, preventing long-term potentiation keeps new memories from consolidating into long-term memory. So the mice in the experiments might learn how to run the maze, but then if we give them the propanolol or give them shocks that prevent that strengthening of connections between neurons, they won't retain the memory over time. Victims of car accidents, rapes, and traumas um, who were given propanolol as opposed to a placebo were um, they less likely to show signs of post-traumatic stress disorder because it interfered with their long-term storage of traumatic memories. And that's pretty interesting. That was only done experimentally, but it's interesting to think what might happen with that in the future. Implicit memories include memories for skills, classically an operant conditioned behavior or operantly conditioned behaviors, and also our well-learned motor skills like how to ride a bike, how to type, how to play a musical instrument. These are implicit because they can't be declared in the same way. And they're housed in the cerebellum and the basal ganglia of the brain. The cerebellum is that flowery little brain that sits on top of the brain stem and the basal ganglia sits just behind the prefrontal cortex or just behind the cortex in the front of your brain.